Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 6732 in the name of Claire Adamson on behalf of the Constitution, Europe, External Affairs and Culture Committee on the impact of Brexit on devolution. I would invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons. I call on Claire Adamson on behalf of the Constitution, Europe, External Affairs and Culture Committee to speak to and to move the motion. Around nine minutes, please, Ms Adamson. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. May I first thank my committee clerks, our advisers, and all those who gave evidence and submissions to your inquiry for their interest and support. Presiding Officer, there shall be a Scottish Parliament. Six simple words, but almost exactly 24 years ago, the Scotland Act, the statutory underpinning of our Scottish Parliament, became law. First lines of legislation are seldom memorable, but I would suggest that this is the exception. The most recent Scotland Act, enacted in 2016, was intended, in the words of Prime Minister David Cameron, to deliver one of the most powerful devolved parliaments in the world. However, the impact of Brexit, as well as UK legislation following the UK's withdrawal from Europe, cannot be overstated. Presiding officer, the conventions which underpin devolution are coming under strain. This was the key message from our inquiry. A report into the impact of Brexit and devolution was informed by evidence sessions themed on legislative, legislative consent, being the means by which the devolved legislature indicates that it's content for the UK Parliament to pass law on a devolved area. The UK-EU Trade and Cooperation Agreement, the TCA, implementation of the Protocol on Ireland-Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland and retained EU law, a bill that is currently passing through the Commons. And, of course, intergovernmental relations, which runs through all of these topics. We chose to focus on three areas, regulatory divergence, the Sewell Convention and delegated powers, which my de Deputy Convener will cover in his summing up. While technical in nature, our report is about how we legislate and what we regulate. There are implications for our everyday lives, including in how we do business, how we protect the environment, and how we ensure the safety of both the products on our shelves and the food on our plates. Our earlier report published in February highlighted the tension that can exist between open trade and regulatory divergence. In this report, we looked at the extent to which regulatory divergence is limited both within the UK internal market and between the UK internal market and the EU single market. We address the possibility of different policy and legislative priorities within the four nations of the UK and the extent to which dev devolution needs to evolve to allow for that. When the UK was a member of the EU, options for diversion within, divergence within the UK in devolved policy areas within EU competence were minimal. The statutory obligation was on the UK to comply with EU law. Now, of course, that obligation no longer applies, except in the case of Northern Ireland, although the protocol bill currently being passed through the UK Parliament may change that too. We should also note that the policy of both the Scottish Government and the Welsh Government is to keep pace with Europe. It is now possible for a much higher level of regulatory divergence both within the four parts of the UK and between the e UK and the EU. There are, though, commitments to non-regression in environmental standards, labour rights and social responsibility in the TCA. And in this way, the TCA seeks to establish a level playing field between the EU and the UK on trade and investment. However, it is important to note that divergence is allowed under the TCA. Professor Catherine Barnard spoke of active and passive divergences. The former can arise from a deliberate policy choice, the latter due to EU-level decisions that the UK no longer needs to follow. However, our businesses must comply with EU law to be able to sell into Europe. And we don't know the extent to which non-regression principle and the level playing field provisions might therefore limit regulatory divergence. The Northern Irish... Pro yes, we'll take a... Willie Rennie. Yeah, I'm listening carefully to what she's saying. Did, did, did the committee come up with any actual examples of practical divergence that's causing harm right now? 
because I can't really find any great examples of this. The whole exercise to, seems to be rather futile. Claire I, I would suggest not, Mr. Mr. Rennie, but in terms of, of the examples, they, they were in the evidence that was given to the committee, and I would refer him to, to that evidence. Uh, and also the, the fact that this is an extremely fast-moving situation, and almost as we are looking at these issues, other um, things come on the table, like the uh, uh, Northern Irish Protocol Bill. So um, I think it's, it's a technical bill, and, but it does lay out the challenges that may face us ahead. Um, in this situation. The Northern Irish Protocol negotiated in Brexit settlement is a further complicating factor. Dr Lisa Clare Whitten told us the UK must keep Northern Ireland aligned with any changes made in the EU legal instruments included within the scope of the protocol. This has been described as dynamic alignment. To date, this has involved 300 instruments and suggests UK-EU divergence leading in time to divergence between the Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK. The fundamental question being asked is the extent to which devolution settlement can accommodate this divergence. Dr Whitten suggests the Scottish Government's commitment to align with EU law where appropriate could mean potentially opting into the same divergences trajectory as Northern Ireland under the protocol. John Thompson's and Sons, a Belfast-based business, said, the challenge for Scotland is how do we follow EU regulations when we are under the UK single market rules. During a visit to Brussels in June, we heard firsthand of the EU's concerns for the integrity of the single market, whether divergence could impact safeguarding in the public in areas such as animal health or food safety. Which brings me to the EU retained EU law bill. I won't say too much about that here, given that we're taking evidence on the Legislative Consent Memorandum next week in our committee. But to quote the Welsh Government, any proposals to deregulate in a way that could reduce the important social and environmental protections and high product standards that consumers and workers in Wales have come to expect are not acceptable. Clearly, there is a substantive difference between the UK Government and the devolved Scottish and Welsh Governments. And this raises questions concerning the capacity of the UK to potentially accommodate four different regulatory environments within a cohesive internal market <coughs> while complying with international agreements. Whether existing institutional mechanisms are sufficient to resolve differences or disputes between the four governments, and how devolution should evolve to address these. Presiding officer, if I could turn to the Sewell Convention. The Sewell Convention with the mechanism for obtaining the consent of a devolved legislature where the UK Parliament intends to pass primary legislation in a devolved area. Sewell Convention established that the UK Parliament would, quote, not normally legislate in areas that are devolved without the agreement of the devolved institutions. The Institute for Government observed that prior to 2018, consent had been, been withheld by one or other of the devolved legislatures on just nine occasions, and in Scotland's case, only once. And that the UK Parliament had never passed legislation without consent when the relevant provisions fell within the scope of Sewell. Since 2018, there have been six Brexit-related bills passed at Westminster without the consent of this Parliament. Dr Chris McCorkindale, the committee's adviser, noted that pre-Brexit, the Convention was understood to have both a policy and constitutional arm, was respected as a constitutional rule that protected devolved autonomy and facilitated shared government, that any decision to withhold consent was the exception rather than the rule, and legislation in devolved areas would only be made where it was felt necessary on the part of the UK Government or invited by the Scottish Government. In Professor Nicola McEwen's view, the paradox of the Sewell Convention is that it only functioned as a principle and process that fostered culture and cooperation as long as its limits were, not, were less untested. Presiding officer, we believe that there is clearly a need for public debate about these issues and our committee will, has launched a call, lodged a call for evidence to encourage businesses and civic society and the wider public to join that debate. So I welcome this debate this afternoon, presiding officer, and I move the motion in my name.
Thank you, Ms. Adamson. I now call on Neil Gray, uh, Minister, to uh, uh, speak, and around eight minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government welcomes this uh, thoughtful and important uh, unanimous report from the Committee, and I join the com Convener, Claire Adamson, in thanking the members and the clerks for their work in this important report. The report clearly demonstrates that the impact of Brexit on devolution has been entirely negative, or in the Committee's words, I quote, there are fundamental concerns which need to be addressed by the Scottish Parliament in relation to how devolution works outside the EU. The causes for these concerns are clear. The Sewell Convention has been undermined. The views of this Parliament have been ignored. The UK Government Ministers have, them have given themselves powers to intrude into devolved matters without any need to for our consent. But none of this is surprising. After all, the slogan of the Brexit campaign was to take back control. It was always going to be hard to believe that the UK Government would take back control from its imagined subservience to the EU, only to share powers and decision-making with the devolved government. Devolution was always going to suffer from the instinct to hoard power in Whitehall, combined with the continued claim of unlimited parliamentary sovereignty of Westminster. It is crucial that these consequences of Brexit are widely understood. The Scottish Government therefore fully supports the Committee's rep recommendation that, and I quote, there needs to be a much wider public debate to address the fundamental questions arising from the impact of Brexit on how devolution works. In these remarks, I'm going to concentrate on the two areas of particular concern identified by the Committee, the Sewell Convention and UK Minister's power to act in devolved areas. First, the report lays out clearly the damage that has been done to the Sewell Convention since Brexit. Until uh, the 2016 referendum, the Sewell Convention had been observed consistently by UK governments and parliaments since 1999. The Convention was therefore functioning as intended, protecting the competence of this Parliament and the Scottish Government from unwanted actions by the UK Government, using the still unlimited powers of Westminster on areas of responsibility vested here. That has not been the case since 2016, as the report sets out. On six occasions, the UK Government has sought the consent of this Parliament and then ignored our views. On each of these occasions, after this Parliament has refused its consent, the UK Government has claimed that circumstances are not normal, so it can proceed with its preferred route, set aside our inconvenient disagreement. But the circumstances of these bills are precisely what the Convention was intended to prevent. To take the most prominent and damaging example, the UK Internal Market Act, legislation that was in no way necessary to implement Brexit, that act changed the competence of this Parliament indirectly through the market access principles and directly by reserving subsidy control. These are exactly the kinds of changes to our competence that the Sewell Convention was designed to prevent. The view of the Scottish Government is that the Convention can have no force if it can and is set aside by the UK Government on the grounds it wants to impose its preferred policy approach on the Scottish Parliament against our express wishes. And the Convention can provide no meaningful protection for this Parliament if the UK Government can decide circumstances are not normal retrospectively after the Scottish Parliament has made its decision and refused consent. I give way. Martin Whitfield. I, I'm, I'm very grateful to Neil Gray to give way. Does he agree with me, although the power doesn't lie in this place, that actually the need for a legislative consent motion should appear far, far more fully at the front of a bill in Westminster so that all members of the Parliament down the road are aware of the need to seek the consent of the devolved authorities? Minister. Martin Whitfield uh, speaks with some authority, having served in that uh, House uh, down the road, and uh, I uh, agree with him that I think that would be a very useful measure to uh, bring attention uh, to colleagues down the road as to the implications of uh, what they are uh, debating and deciding. I think that would be a very novel uh, prospect uh, for colleagues down the road to consider. However, I don't hold my breath uh, as to that coming about, given the disrespect to this place and the other devolved governments and parliaments uh, since Brexit in particular. The UK Government has therefore downgraded the Convention from a constitutional rule, as a Convention should be, into an optional process which it might observe if it wishes. We are now faced with the retained EU Law Bill, which will repeal important regulations and safeguards built up through 47 years of EU membership. This Parliament has made clear 
its desire to align with the high standards of the EU, and we have passed our own continuity bill. There must be severe doubts, to say the least, that the UK Government will change the bill to exclude devolved matters, whatever the view of this Parliament or businesses and people across Scotland. The process of Brexit has therefore done severe damage to the Sewell Convention, as the Committee's report makes clear. But we should, uh, we should be clear that it is not Brexit itself, disastrous though Brexit is for Scotland that has enabled this constitutional damage. It is the fundamental design of the UK system which allows the UK Government and Westminster to impose and overrule in this way. I give way to Willie Rennie. The Minister will know that I'm a, I was a strong supporter of the keeping pace powers, but there are thousands of legal instruments going through Europe on a regular basis. Um, how many have actually um, involved keeping pace uh, through the Scottish Parliament process? Minister. Obviously, we across this Parliament want to make sure that we continue to align with the European Union as closely as possible. Unfortunately, the actions of Westminster have made it very difficult for uh, us to uh, be able to do that in all cases. So we'll, but we will always seek, uh, as far as possible, to maintain, ensure that we can maintain uh, high standards of uh, EU regulation, um, in spite of the fact that uh, we are expecting a binfire of regulation coming uh, from Westminster. And I hope that Willie Rennie would support uh, that uh, purpose, in spite of the fact that his UK colleagues uh, support uh, Brexit and not returning into the EU uh, as, uh, as yet. Um, this was a deliberate choice of the UK Government. It could, in the 2016 Scotland Act, before Brexit, four Prime Ministers ago, I believe, have set out binding legal safeguards for Sewell and this Parliament, as re recommended by the Smith Commission. It chose not to, but to enact a much weaker form of safeguard, which provides no legal protection at all. Wherever uh, colleagues stand on the question of Scottish independence, and there is of course a majority uh, for independence in this chamber as elected by the people of Scotland, that should concern us all. I am also grateful to the committee for highlighting the growing issue of UK ministers' power to act in devolved areas. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has also done important work on this subject, particularly on the UK's Professional Qualifications Bill, as set out in the report. Like the overwhelming majority of people in Scotland, the Scottish Government opposes Brexit, which has been imposed upon us. But given this imposition, there are practical legislative matters that need to be addressed. In our approach to Brexit, which, uh, Brexit legislation, which we would clearly rather not have, we have accepted that there can be circumstances in which UK or GB-wide secondary legislation may be the most appropriate way to legislate. This was particularly true when faced with the volume and time constraints of legislation as a result of Brexit. Pragmatically, we were therefore able to accept concurrent powers in Brexit legislation when accompanied by understandings that allowed this Parliament to scrutinise the exercise of these powers. However, as the report sets out, such concurrent powers are becoming more and more common in UK Government legislative proposals. It is crucial that any such powers have the right statutory protections for the Scottish Government and this Parliament. Again, the retained EU Law Bill will be an important test of the UK Government's willingness to take account of the views of this Parliament and indeed the Senate. The bill contains extensive powers for UK ministers to act in devolved areas without the need for consent. That is completely unacceptable and leaves Sewell in absolute tatters. The best course of action would be to scrap this bill altogether, but failing that, it must be amended to prevent any further undermining of this parliament. To conclude, presiding officer. Back in 2016, the UK Government promised that the powers of this Parliament would be enhanced and expanded because of Brexit. Like all the promises made about leaving the EU, that has proved to be the opposite of the truth. Far from enhancing this Parliament, Brexit has seen the UK Government and Westminster undermine and constrain our powers and responsibilities. The wishes of the people of Scotland have been ignored, and Brexit has led to the end of the Sewell Convention as a reliable and binding rule of the constitutional order. It has led to UK Ministers taking power to act in devolved areas without consent. It has demonstrated that the UK is no voluntary union of equal partners. The U Scottish Government believes that there must be a wide public debate on all these matters in Scotland and, seriously con and serious consideration of the best future for our country, including independence, as the only way by which we can overturn the damage of Brexit, the democratic deficit and undermining of this Parliament by Westminster. Therefore, we welcome this report and support its recommendations for such a debate.
Thank you, Minister. I now call on Maurice Golden. Around seven minutes, please, Mr Golden. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As a member of the Constitution, Europe, External Affairs and Culture Committee, can I first start by extending my thanks to the clerks and all of those who have provided evidence to enable the committee to produce the report impact of Brexit on the devolution settlement. As exemplified in the report, the evidence provided has covered a wide range of emerging legislative and constitutional developments brought about since Brexit. And the report and the evidence presented to the committee highlights that the devolution settlement has faced a number of challenges as a result of the UK leaving the EU and as we continue to transition to a new legislative framework and new constitutional arrangements, it is critical that we keep the devolution settlement central to the decision-making process and continue to develop and evolve it to best reflect the interests of Scotland's people and its two governments. And throughout the evidence received by committee, it is clear that the best option for respecting the devolution settlement and developing it is through dialogue, consensual working and mutual respect. And the Scottish Government must work closely with the UK Government and the UK Government must work closely with the Scottish Government in order to achieve this. Happy to. Minister. I first of all welcome uh, Morris Golden's comments um, around uh, the importance of the devol devolution settlement being respected, but can he advise uh, colleagues how he expects that respect agenda to be continued if Westminster governments continue to ignore uh, the Scottish Parliament with the Senate, uh, turning down legislative consent in areas of devolved responsibility? Morris Golden. Well, first of all, I can say from personal experience, when I was Chief Whip during the Brexit period, my opposition number, Graham Day, was regularly briefed by the UK government and I was kept in the dark. He used to inform me about what legislation was progressing through. And I think that shows the respect between the two governments. I'll need to make some progress just at the moment. Um, and throughout the evidence received by the committee, it is clear that the best option for us uh, to date, there have been strains that have, been, uh, that have tested elements of the devolution settlement. Take the Sewell Con Convention, which the Minister just raised. Since Brexit, its application and interpretation has clearly been tested in a new way. And the recent review of intergovernmental relations undertaken jointly by the UK Government and the devolved administrations recognises these challenges. But through dialogue and conversation, these strains can be resolved and the introduction of new intergovernmental machinery for engagement is designed to promote collaboration and avoid disagreements. Where disagreements still exist, a new dispute resolution mechanism has been put in place to address these disagreements and a number of witnesses providing evidence noted the importance of this new process as a mechanism that could address any future disagreements between governments. Much has been made by the SNP of the impact of the UK Internal Market Bill on devolution, but through its implementation, the UK Government is clear it wants to protect the devolution settlement and work with devolved administrations on the principles of mutual respect, trust and respecting the reserve powers of each devolved government. The SNP claimed that the UK Internal Market Act would and I quote, green light the UK government to halt progress in setting of regulations and standards. But to date, there has been no rollback on regulations in areas such as the environment. In fact, the UK is making even firmer commitments than the EU. Since Brexit, happy to. Jenny Minto. I thank Maurice Golden for taking an intervention. Um, isn't it fair to say, Mr Golden, though, that the, sorry, through the chair, that uh, the EU sets a minimum and as a member of the, U the European Union, we could expand our environmental targets? Maurice Golden. Well, the reality is that the UK government is going f uh, further than the EU requires. And in fact, the, that is what the opposite of what the SNP have suggested. The reality is, is quite different. But since Brexit, the Scottish 
Parliament has received powers over a whole host of new competencies, and it will be at the discretion of the Scottish Government to decide how it deals with retained EU law that is devolved and where and when it might want to align to EU law. Now, this in turn could create regulatory divergence between Scotland and the rest of the UK, but to date, no major tensions have arisen. This might be largely because the Scottish Government have chosen not to align with newly introduced EU law, despite it being their stated default policy to do so. But at some point in the future, there will no doubt be situations where constructive dialogue is required. And through existing common frameworks and the introduction of new ones, if required, any tensions within devolved settlement can be resolved by managing regulatory divergence on a consensual basis. The evidence the Committee has heard on the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill highlights a number of challenges regarding the devolution settlement. But again, progress is being made on the issue and the Prime Minister's stated position on the subject is to find a negotiated settlement with the EU and he is confident that with goodwill and pragmatism a breakthrough can happen in negotiations over the protocol. Deputy President Officer, it is clear that it is taking time for Scotland's two governments to come to terms with the new constitutional and legislative arrangements that have arisen as a result of Brexit. And this is work in progress. But critically, work is progressing. As we move forward, legitimate issues regarding the impact of Brexit on the devolution settlement still exist. These are surmountable. But parties will have to want to work together to resolve these issues. The UK Government has a clear incentive to ensure that as a result of Brexit, the devolution settlement is protected. But can the same be said of the SNP Government? Their actions and rhetoric regarding Brexit show that they will take every opportunity to sow division for their own political grandstanding. So there is a clear choice for the SNP act in their own political interests and their obsession with separation or act in the interests of the Scottish people and engage in the process constructively. Thank you, Mr Golden. I now call uh, Sarah Boyack. Around six minutes, please, Ms Boyack. Thanks very much, Presiding Officer. Um, I do also want to add my thanks to all those who gave evidence to our committee and to the work of the committee clerks in the vital work that they do. Um, and to start off by saying that many of us didn't want to be here in this place, dealing with the consequences of the UK's departure from the EU. And the current workload of our KIAC committee demonstrates the ongoing fallout, which is the result of actions by the UK Conservative government, whether intentionally or by accident. The impact of Brexit on the UK's constitutional settlement um, was not taken into account and was not considered by them during Brexit or since. And uh, I hope that Maurice Golden's optimism is informed because it's not what you do, say, it's what you do. There were two broad areas in the committee's inquiry, regulatory divergence and the Seoul Convention. And there's been some good debate um, this afternoon about the Seoul Convention, which I want to follow up. But we have also voted uh, unanimously to condemn the Northern Ireland Protocol being proposed by the UK government. That was in June this year, and it was due to our collective concerns about trade, international law, and the integrity of the Good Friday Agreement. But it's just one of the pieces of legislation introduced by the Tories at Westminster that not only challenges trade and cohesion, but also, as Claire Adamson said, our constitutional settlement. Uh, I will take an intervention. Ms. Martin Whitfield. I'm, I'm very grateful to Sarah Boyack for taking that point. And she mentions the Good Friday Agreement. And does she agree with me that one of the strengths of that was that it was, in essence, an international agreement reached with cooperation across a number of countries, a number of interested parties? And one of the challenges is of, of Brexit is that we appear now to have a wall about discussing with our neighbours the solutions to problems that we have. Sarah Boyack. <clears throat> That is absolutely right, and I think it's, it's incumbent on the Conservative government to acknowledge that and accept it. And that's why we need change. So it's ensuring parliamentary accountability and transparency. And it's not just people in this parliament, I would say to my colleague Martin Whitfield, that are concerned. If you look at the work that's been done in the House of Lords, their Secondary Legislation Scrutiny Committee, the Delegated Powers and Regulatory Reform Committee, um, one of the reports was called Government by Diktat, 
and the other one was called Democracy Denied? Question mark. So there is concern across the UK, and Stella Creasy's powerful speech on the Northern Ireland Protocol um, Bill actually brings it to life that there's not just us in this chamber. And in fact, securing unanimity in this report, I think, tells you something about the cross-party work we're doing in this parliament. But it's not just the cross-party work we're doing. We also need work from the Scottish Government. And I think Willie Rennie's point um, was really important. We were discussing this very morning, the need at our committee for open and transparent reporting from the Scottish Government on the use of the keeping pace powers, but critically also where the keeping pace powers are not used. And it does require work. Um, I want to follow up the comments that have been made uh, by colleagues about the Sewell Convention. Its, its origins were in the, in the passage of the Labour Government Scotland Bill in 98, when Lord Sewell said that the UK Parliament would not normally legislate and devolve matters without the consent of the Scottish Parliament. Now, what is interesting is how successful that has been since 1999, but actually it's been since 2018 where the number of occasions where Parliament's refused its consent is on the increase. Previous to that, we had a mechanism for dialogue between the UK and Scottish governments, both at ministerial and official level, enabling shared policy objectives and enabling them to be achieved as quickly as possible. And the um, work that was done um, putting the Convention in the Parliament's standing orders in 2005, following the Procedures Committee report in the Convention, I think was constructive. Um, but as others have said, the evidence is clear. Uh, Professor uh, Aileen McHard pointed out that the Convention has been seriously tested by the Brexit process and its ongoing legislative aftermath. We have had the experience of people working together across party. The Kalman and the Smith Commissions both changed the powers of the Parliament. But there's been a constitutional failure to respect the devolution settlement after the passage of Brexit and things cannot be allowed to go on as they are. So we need action. And I, th I wasn't surprised when the Minister said independence is the only solution. But as we all know, Brexit, independence would be Brexit times 10. So let's focus on change we can deliver now that would make the difference. We need to increase transparency and accountability, not just between the governments, but to enable our parliaments in Scotland, in Wales, in the UK and in Northern Ireland to hold our governments to account. We published a paper over the summer, Scottish Labour, to require a duty to cooperate because increasingly there are policy areas where we need to work together. For example, we suggested a governance council on energy to give a joint approach between the powers we have on planning and the reserve powers in the grid to make sure that we can deliver the low carbon affordable renewables that we all aspire to replacing the House of Lords with the directly elected Senate of House and Regions. We need to send a clear message to this Tory government. We've had a unanimous committee report. Their lack of, lack of respect is unacceptable and we need urgent action to deliver transparency, accountability and scrutiny. And I would also like to see the Scottish Government doing the heavy lifting at the ministerial and government level. We need to work hard and it will be right across our committees to hold our, our Scottish government, but also the UK government, to reflect on where we want to align with the EU, but to debate where we don't. And our constituents, our businesses, our environmental campaigners, they need to see that transparency. So it's up to people across this chamber to work and also to send a clear message that change is needed and it's needed urgently. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Ms Boyack. And I now call uh, Willie Rennie. Around six minutes, please, Mr Rennie. Uh, the convener thought, probably thought I was being critical of the committee's report. Um, uh, far from it. It was Brexit I was calling uh, futile, uh, but also incredibly damaging. And we've seen some of the... Uh, the facts, the evidence that's emerged uh, within the last few months. Europe's largest stock market is now in Paris, not London, for the first time since records began. The Centre for European Reform did a study and they looked at the impact of the UK's economy, of Brexit, and comparing that with other countries of similar economic records. And the conclusion was sobering. The final quarter of 2021 GDP was 5.2% smaller. Investment was 13.7% lower. The goods trade was 13.6% lower. GDP, investment, goods trade, all lower than what they would have been 
if the UK had remained in the EU. And Mark Carney, the former Governor of the Bank of England, he said in 2016 the British economy was 90 per cent the size of Germany's. Now it's less than 70 per cent. He went on that devaluation that was associated with that did not bring an upside because they are with more competitive markets and exports because it was sabotaged by the barriers that we put up at the borders, preventing those improvement in exports. Michael Saunders, who recently left the Bank's Monetary Policy Committee, said the UK economy as a whole has been permanently damaged by Brexit. What's interesting is that these problems have been created because of trade barriers, restrictions on immigration and also low confidence rather than divergence. And we're talking primarily today about the consequences of divergence. But my point is that I think the damage that's been done so far is not through divergence, but because of all these other factors. And what's striking about the devolution aspects is that this debate doesn't seem to have moved on in three years. Still the same issues that we were discussing three years ago, and many years before that as well. We're still at the stage of discussing possibilities rather than firm problems. May, looks like, could have, are littered throughout the report. However, the hyperbole on both sides, I have to say, is as striking as it was three years ago. On the one hand, it's claimed there's massive ramifications for devolution. And on the other hand, Brexit freedoms will free the United Kingdom. Neither have materialised. They'll take an intervention from the Minister. Minister. Thank you. I, I thank Willie Rennie for giving way. Does he not uh, accept, though, that there has been a clear impact on devolution, given the six areas that we've already talked about, uh, where the, the legislative consent has been refused by this Parliament, but, uh, and yet the Westminster Government has continued to progress, and the prob probability of them continue to do so on the upcoming retained EU law bill? Willie Rennie, I can give you the time back. I mean, my, my main point is, actually, we have not really had debates about substance on divergence. I understand there are technical issues and I understand the real problems with the Seoul Convention. I get all that. I get that. But there are actually the issues around about divergence have not materialised in the way that has been claimed. And the reasons are pretty clear because I think um, if you look at the pressures that are being applied to the United Kingdom, they are quite significant. We have not really had the benefits of uh, the Brexit freedoms. If you look at what George Eustace has said this week when he condemned the Australia deal. So there's no massive benefits uh, from Brexit, as was claimed. We've only done three trade deals. One was with Europe, the TCA. One was with New Zealand, and the other one with Australia. I mean, they've not really gained much more. In fact, it's more restrictive than what we had, obviously, with Europe. And Australia and New Zealand are hardly models for uh, success. So my point is, we've not really benefited um, from those apparent Brexit freedoms. But neither have we had the degree of divergence that was talked about as well. When I challenged the Minister about how many times the keeping pace powers has been used, he wasn't able to really tell me, even though thousands of instruments are going through the European Commission frequently. So he was unable to tell me that. We've not really got a worked out process, which I'll return to uh, later on. Now, I've opposed Brexit. I've been very clear about that. I believe that it was in an interconnected world. The theoretical independence was a complete folly. It has introduced bureaucratic and physical barriers at ports which has slowed down and often prevented trade. Not because of any divergence issue, but because that really hasn't happened yet, as far as I can see. The reality is that powerful forces drive the United Kingdom, Scotland, Northern Ireland and the EU into alignment, whatever the actual constitutional arrangement. The first and most powerful is the need to trade. The EU is a massive market for United Kingdom's goods, vice versa too. Manufacturers are not going to produce two production lines in order to trade separately with UK standards and European standards. They're going to meet the best standard and sell into both. That's pretty clear. The report highlights that. 
The second is that Northern Ireland is a dynamic alignment, which means that the UK will be constantly conscious of the regulations as they impact Northern Ireland and therefore as they impact the United Kingdom. And finally is the non-regression arrangements in the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, which means that there is a degree of pragmatic alignment between the EU and the UK. Those irresistible forces mean that divergence, whilst theoretically possible, yes, it's theoretically possible, may turn out not to be as traumatic as first feared. Now, Brexit's still incredibly damaging. I've already highlighted that. And we've not even got started on diversion if it ever does happen. But equally, Brexit freedoms are unlikely to be as dynamic and beneficial as first promoted too. So it begs the question, why do we bother with all of this? What was the point of doing Brexit if we're actually not going to get any of the benefits, none of the benefits? But equally, the argument about drive, using Europe to drive towards independence is equally folly, because we should not be using um, European issues to drive independence. We should be learning the lessons of Brexit, the chaos that it's already caused in terms of trade and economic damage. And equally, it's, it is futile. I think the whole process is futile. The fact is we still don't really know, and the report highlights this, we don't really know how much divergence there has actually been. And if we don't actually know, does it really affect our daily lives? And I'm not even sure that it really does. So, some, I mean, I hate politics sometimes because it's all bloody fabricated. The, the, the whole thing is just inflated. The, the, the inflated arguments and hyperbole don't really help the argument. I may need what to need save to you do... from yourself, Mr Rennie, but if you could begin <laughs> winding up, I'd be very I'll, grateful. I'll, I'll conclude. My answers to all of this, as you would expect, federalism is the answer. An agreement between the nations and regions of the UK to agree and work together, to continue to push towards alignment with Europe, to make sure that we work together to remove the trade barriers so that we can all grow together. And for goodness sake, let's not go down the path of independence. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Rennie. We now move to the open debate. I call Jenny Minto to be followed by Oliver Mundell for around well, a generous six minutes, uh, Ms Minto. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I would also like to put on record my thanks to those who took part in our roundtable discussions and submitted evidence, the clerks for their diligent work, and my fellow committee members for leaving party allegiances at the committee room door to allow us to scrutinise this important subject, the impact of Brexit on devolution. As Sarah Boyack has said, we really didn't want to be here. If I may, convener, I'm going to slightly stray into the committee's evidence session last week on the retained EU law bill. Uh, I asked about the practical impact of this legislation on the normal person in the street. How would they be affected? Perhaps Mr Rennie would like to listen to what Dr Kirsty Hood KC said. She noted that EU legislation is woven into so much of our law over the last 47 years. She said it's difficult to imagine a sector or area of the law in which there's not been an impact of some kind, although that impact might not always be obvious to people during their daily life or daily business. I believe the same can be said for Brexit on our dev devolved settlement. Each decision around Brexit is related. Each piece of legislation is related. These have or will Im impact on our devolution settlement. As our convener laid out in her introduction, we gathered evidence on legislative consent, implementation of the TCA and Northern Ireland Protocol, retained EU law and intergovernmental relationships. During our evidence session the, uh, on the TCA, I was struck with a response from Professor Ian Forrester to a question about collaboration and coordination between the parliaments and, UK, and, sorry, and governments of the four nations of the UK. He suggested, and took a slightly different view from uh, that of Maurice Golden, that there was perhaps an elephant in the room, suggesting that there is a difficulty in the UK government's approach to relationships with other countries, which, and I quote, hinders the resolution of daily problems that neighbours have to confront. Reading the report and reviewing some of the evidence we heard, I reflected that setting the right tone and building constructive relationships, whether between the EU and UK or across the devolved nations, was key to making the best out of a bad situation. Perhaps we need to confront that elephant in the room. Martin Whitfield. I am very grateful for Jenny Minto giving me on, on what I think is a really an essential element of this discussion, which is about relationships. Would she agree with me 
that perhaps it is for the parliaments rather than the governments to try and build these relationships, in particular to get over the challenges of legislative consent. Jenny Minto. Thank the member for that intervention. And yes, um, as I said earlier, um, there has to be better relationships or, or stronger relationships between governments, but I also think parliaments, and as I'll touch on later in my um, speech. Um, doo -doo -doo. The, this is true for economic reasons and for political ones. As our report says, some of our witnesses highlighted the impact of the UK economy for diver of divergence from EU regular regulatory standards. The EU is the largest single market in the world. 2019 data shows that the value of Scotland's manufactured goods exports to the EU and the rest of the world was higher than the value of exports to the rest of the United Kingdom. Businesses in Scotland, therefore, need to be aware of any divergences as they may, affect, uh, in effect, stop goods and services getting into the EU market. Dr Zulig told us that as long as there is an economic relationship, what is decided in Brussels matters hugely to the UK economy and UK businesses. So I would argue as long as Scotland is part of the UK, what is decided in London matters hugely to the Scottish economy and Scottish businesses. For example, as Willie Rennie has um, already mentioned, the, UK, the UK's flagship post-Brexit trade deal with Australia is not an example of global Britain at its best, but not actually a very good deal, according to the former Environment Secretary, George Eustace. Many of us have known this for a long time, but now that a former Conservative Environment Secretary has fessed up, there can be no credible dispute about it now. This admission in a week where the London stock market was eclipsed by Paris as Europe's largest, not the Brexit bonus the people of Scotland were promised. However, Professor McEwen did highlight the Scottish Government's productive relationship with DEFRA compared to the more strained relationship with the Department for Business, Enterprise and Innovation. I find this inconsistency in the UK Government's Department's relationships with Scotland very concerning. How can this lead to the best decisions being made? The committee heard that both the Scottish and Welsh governments have raised concerns in recent legislative consent memorandums about the lack of meaningful engagement prior to the introduction of UK bills. For example, in relation to the Northern Ireland Protocol, Protocol Bill, the Welsh Senate notes that this lack of engagement plainly breaches the principles in the Intergovernmental Relations Review that sets out how the UK and devolved governments should work with each other. We took evidence on the operation of the Sewell Convention, uh, as has been um, discussed, uh, debated earlier. Um, I would also comment on Martin Whitfield's intervention earlier that the House of Lords Constitution Committee believe it would be desirable for all efforts to be taken to resolve substantive disagreements on legislative consent matters before a bill is introduced to Parliament. In its view, this could be achieved through the more robust arrangements for joint working, including the new dispute resolution process agreed as part of the review of intergovernmental relations. Presiding officer, um, to conclude. I began by suggesting that the elephant in the room was the state of relationships between legislators across the UK and the UK government's relationship with European Union. I'm pleased that in our conclusions the committee has acknowledged this and has already shared and discussed this report at the recent interparliamentary forum in Cardiff, but also importantly is extending this discussion more widely and will launch a significant committee inquiry which will allow businesses, civic society and the wider public in Scotland to engage in these very important issues. Thank you very much, Ms Minto. I now call Oliver Mundell, who will be followed by Alistair Allen. Again, a generous six minutes, uh, Mr Mundell. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd normally start a speech like this by saying what a pleasure it is to have the opportunity to speak in the debate. Uh, but the hours wasted in the previous session listening to Michael Russell ranting about Brexit continue to traumatise me. Uh, never in the history of devolution has so much faux outrage and grievance been shoehorned into the same contribution. And I mean the same contribution because members who will present for present will know it was literally the same speech under a slightly different debating title delivered on a near weekly basis. I make this point for a serious reason, as I believe it highlights what was a major missed opportunity for this Parliament and indeed the Scottish Government to influence the detail and practical realities of leaving the EU. Instead of working constructively in Scotland's interest 
is part of Team UK. The strategy, as so often was the case, is to stoke maximum uh, grievance. Yep. Minister. I actually find Oliver Mundell's uh, comments there astounding because I'm old enough to remember because I was actually uh, sat in the House of Commons at the time uh, when the Scottish Government put forward its suggestions of a compromise that were rejected out of hand by Theresa May right before she set out her statement at Lancaster House which uh, set out her self-defeating red line. So what basis could uh, Oliver Mundell suggest that the Scottish Government didn't approach the, pers the perspective uh, from a constructive basis and was just disrespected by the UK Government? Oliver Mundell. I am presiding officer because the Scottish Government's approach was to block Brexit. It wasn't about uh, making the best of a situation, albeit I accept they didn't want. It was about blocking and disrupting the process uh, throughout. It was working behind the UK Government's back uh, with EU politicians uh, and officials. Um, and it was about trying to stoke grievance um, and promote independence uh, rather than build consensus uh, in the UK. Uh, and I think that's very uh, disappointing. Uh, I think it's disrespectful to the people of Scotland. Uh, and uh, I think we continue uh, to see that now uh, as we seek to try and build uh, and rebuild trust, improve intergovernmental relations. Uh, the truth is, it's the same bad faith actors, albeit minus uh, Michael Russell, who retain their seat at the table. Scotland's interests are represented by a Scottish Government that not only doesn't want Brexit to work, uh, but doesn't want the UK to work. It's led by a First Minister who doesn't believe in devolution. And all of this is against a backdrop where the wider uh, political debate is poisoned by a toxic nationalism that tries to tell us that leaving the EU has been disruptive while simultaneously telling my constituents that border checks on their doorstep would be nothing to worry about. These are the same people telling us that recent financial turmoil could have been avoided whilst promoting a half-baked currency plan for an independent Scotland. Talk about hypocrisy. Presiding officer, uh, from a sedentary position and right on cue, some people may be asking, why does this matter? How does this relate to today's debate? The truth is, it's exactly why we find the mechanics of our constitution and inter-parliamentary inter workings under strain. I'm not trying to deny that Brexit has added to this, but I think it would be wrong to ignore the far more significant tensions at play. I'm firmly of the view these find their root in the uncharitable and undemocratic way in which senior leaders in the SNP refused to accept the decision of the 2014 referendum. Rather than setting our country on a course of unity, instead we got more division. Alistair Allen. Member for giving way, and I'm not sure if at any point he intends to turn his attention to the report that we're debating. But um, I just want to ask him if he if he acknowledges that the report that we, we should be talking about uh, is actually not merely the views of politicians. It's the views, the views of people like the Law Society. It's the views of people like the Hansard Society, who gave us evidence, who talked about a number of the, the UK government's constitutional developments of late uh, as representing something close to a constitutional crisis. Oliver Mundell. I, I don't uh, deny evidence the committee has received, but I think our job is to work out how we got to this point and, and what is causing the problem. And I think we can't have an environment of meaningful uh, and constructive cooperation uh, when uh, you have uh, one party in those negotiations uh, and discussions whose sole aim, whose reason for existing, uh, is to try and make sure uh, that those don't work. And I recognise uh, the committee have put in uh, considerable effort to bring this report forward uh, and to identify areas for further exploration. But that does not in itself deliver the political will uh, or environment to take them forward. So while like other members, uh, and I believe the vast majority of Scots, I want to see both uh, Scotland's governments working together to make this parliament and devolution work well. I recognise that reality uh, that uh, some members will be more interested in next week's Supreme Court ruling than in following through on the hard work it will take to make the recommendations in this report real. In this environment, what hope do we have? Provide, presiding officer, the saddest thing is, I don't believe my constituents expect anything to change anytime soon. And while the SNP continues to put its own narrow political interests and its desire to divide our communities first, I, nor do I. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr Mundell. I now call Alistair Allen to be followed by Katie Clark. Dr Allen, uh, a generous six minutes. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, like others, I would uh, want to begin today by thanking uh, all those who made the committee's report possible, including all fellow committee members, committee clerks and the many experts who, as I mentioned, gave evidence to us. Uh, while I will not be so unwise as to attempt to speak for all committee members today, I do think it was uh, creditable that we managed to largely to, to reach uh, consensus in our conclusions. And although I will try to restrict my comments to the areas covered directly by the report, it is worth adding some context by way of update. Um, as we have heard, the committee has more recently also been taking evidence on the UK government's retained EU law bill, which is likely to have dramatic effects both on the statute book in Scotland and on who now gets to amend many parts of it. It was difficult for us to find any legal or constitutional commentators who viewed this piece of legislation with anything other than polite but evident astonishment. The bill involves repealing via sunset clause four, perhaps 5,000 extant UK laws over the next 12 months. The exact number of laws uh, up for the Acts is not clear, as the UK government recently admitted that they had only just discovered 1,400 more that they had forgotten all about. Whatever the number, uh, a great, uh, if presently unidentified, number of these laws covered devolved areas. Many laws in devolved areas will now be amendable by a UK minister rather than by this elected parliament uh, using proposed so-called Henry VIII powers. This is a name which does an injustice if such a thing is really possible to a man who thankfully never managed to legislate in Scotland himself. But to, to quote a report, the committee's view is that the extent of UK ministers' new delegated powers in devolved areas amounts to a significant constitutional change. We have considerable concerns that this has happened and is continuing to happen on an ad hoc and iterative basis without any overarching consideration of the impact on how devolution works. Or, as noted by the committee's own adviser, Dr Chris McCorkindale, Brexit has posed a number of significant challenges to the effective functioning of the UK constitution. In his view, territorial tension has been exposed and exacerbated by the relatively weak constitutional safeguards for devolved autonomy. Now, all of this means that Brexit is testing constitutional norms, including those that undoubtedly exist, even in a state so bizarrely lacking a written constitution as the UK. It is testing such norms to the point of destruction. These conventions were, of course, under significant strain already at a political level, given that, the UK prime, that, that UK Prime Ministers, however brief their tenure, have publicly stated that their aim has been to ignore Scotland's government. Presiding officer, others will no doubt speak today about the various areas, uh, other areas that we cover in our report, the UK-EU trade and cooperation agreement, the protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland, the changing concept of retained EU law and broader intergovernmental relations. But let me, in concluding, presiding officer, concentrate uh, on one particular area, and that is the matter of legislative consent. As the committee convener has set out, um, there was a time when the Sewell Convention, the assumption uh, that the UK Parliament would not normally seek to legislate on devolved matters without the Scottish Parliament's consent, went virtually unchallenged as an idea. Since the Brexit referendum, however, there has been a complete breakdown of the Convention. Notwithstanding the Convention's former political importance as one of the principles behind devolution, the UK Parliament has now begun regularly to routine, uh, <coughs> and routinely to ignore this Parliament whenever we refuse to consent to being legislated for. Among the most notable examples of this are such enormously far-reaching pieces of legislation as the EU Withdrawal Act, the European Union Future Relationship Act, the Subsidy Control Act and the Professional Qualifications Act. Most, uh, Controversially, and as has been alluded to, the United Kingdom Internal Market Act was likewise passed without this Parliament's consent, and now the UK Government shows similar signs of disdain for this Parliament's view on the retained EU Legislation Bill, despite the potentially enormous implications of it on the question of who makes many laws in devolved areas. <coughs> 
Whether the Sewell Convention actually still means very much is now open to question. Indeed, many of our witnesses expressed their doubts about that. One hopes it still has a more binding force than other conventions that exist only in the sphere of the UK Government's ministerial codes, say, or perhaps the locally varying conventions around when to wave to other motorists on single-track roads. <laughs> Professor McHarg pointed out to us uh, that the Sewell Convention has been severely tested by the Brexit process and its ongoing legislative aftermath. The Institute for Government's view, even more directly expressed, is that Brexit has exposed the Convention's limitations as a guarantee of devolved autonomy. Presiding officer, that is not a trivial observation or question, and it is not just the many of us who spent our youth campaigning for a parliamentary democracy in Scotland who are troubled by it. As our committee report makes clear, these fundamental concerns about Westminster's legislative intentions with regard to Holyrood and the powers which Holyrood has in law to stop them are questions on which we would all do well as parliamentarians to reflect. Thank you very much, Dr Allen. I now call Katie Clark to be followed by Colette Stevenson again, a generous six minutes, Ms Clark. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, for the opportunity to contribute to this debate and to congratulate the committee on its report, which, as the convener says, is technical in nature. And I agree with their assessment that there are fundamental concerns which need to be addressed addressed by the Scottish Parliament as to how devolution works outside the European Union. As Sarah Boyack and Willie Rennie said, the negative impact has been considerable, particularly to the economy. The Institute of Government has argued that Brexit has opened up a new space for disagreement in many policy important areas previously subject to European Union law. But I have to say to Oliver Mundell, if his party were going to put a referendum on European Union membership to the people, they should have had a plan for Brexit. Their failure to take responsibility for the position we are in, or indeed the tens of billions of pounds that it has cost the economy, is why we are having this debate today. The approach of the EU government following Brexit could not be said to be one that was supportive of the devolution settlement. Whilst many of the most controversial aspects of the Internal Markets Bill were defeated at Westminster, the Internal Markets Bill was an audacious attempt at a land grab. As has been said by Alistair Allen, there are concerns now that the retained EU law bill could give UK ministers unprecedented powers to scrap European laws, including in devolved areas, and that this Parliament will be unable to have sufficient input or scrutiny. Yes, I'd be happy to take an intervention. Gillian Martin. I'm, I'm very grateful to Katie Clark, and just she, off the back of what she just said, just because something hasn't happened yet doesn't mean to say that it couldn't. It's this could that's the problem. There could be a problem, and it's our duty to make sure that there's no ambiguity at all and there's certainty. Katie Clark. I hope I'll go on to address that um, later on in my contribution, but I think she is indeed correct. Um, to say that we need frameworks that require cooperation in the way that Sarah Boyack was talking earlier on to address these issues. Um, because frankly, um, whether we're a member of the European Union or not, we have to work with Europe. Whether um, she ever gets her way and we leave um, the, Euro the United Kingdom, we will have to work um, with other countries uh, within the, the, the nations of the UK. And we need cooperation agreements. And we need to get those agreements in place because the current situation is not tenable, it's not acceptable. But in the short time available to me, 
I would like to focus on one particular area and the policy in relation to procurement, because the approach that the Scottish Government is taking is quite unlike, for example, the approach being taken by the Welsh Government in relation to the procurement bill, which is currently going through the Westminster Parliament. The overall approach um, from the Scottish Government, as outlined in the committee report, seems to be that the default position will be to align with European Union law. Now, in relation to procurement, one pound out of every three pounds of public money spent is on public procurement. Public contracts represent a significant part of the economy, and there are significant issues in terms of labour and environmental standards, direct awards, state aid and the ability of public bodies to set their own procurement policies, for example, to buy locally, or indeed to insist on trade union recognition or good terms and conditions of the workforce with organisations that they are contracting with. In the TUC report, Leveling Up the UK, the role of state aid, that report outlines the choice that governments within the UK now have on state aid and procurement policy, and whether those choices will be ones that support industrial policy, industrial strategy, local jobs and businesses, and the promotion of high employment and environmental standards. The, the Procurement Reform Scotland Act 2014 is stronger than the regulations in force in England and Wales. And it's clear from the committee report um, that the issue of divergence is a live issue in terms of the discussions taking place. In the past, the European Union cabotage regulations were used as a reason for the tendering of the CalMAC ferries services. Presumably, the tendering process which took place leading up to the award of the ferry contracts to Ferguson Marine took place because the Scottish Government felt unable to make a direct award. This debate highlights the very technical issue of many of the issues that we're discussing, and I think that's you know, very clearly highlighted in the report that we're debating, but I think it also highlights the huge potential for us to look at wider issues, because these issues impact on people's lives and the decisions that this parliament makes day in, day out. Yes, there needs to be improved intergovernment cooperation. The Scottish Government needs to set high standards through public procurement, food procurement, labour and environmental standards and indeed a wide range of other areas that the Scottish Government has responsibility for. I believe that this debate is an important one. It's important that we get these frameworks and these issues right. But the reason that it's important is in terms of what we can deliver as a parliament. And I very much hope that we're able to flesh out some of those real challenges that we have to ensure that we deliver for working people and the people that put us in this parliament as we go forward. Thank you very much, Ms Clark. I now call Colette Stevenson to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Again, a generous uh, six minutes. Ms. Stevenson. Thank you, President Officer, <clears throat> and I thank my colleague Claire Adamson and others on the committee for their work on this important report. The impact of Brexit on Scotland's economy, democracy and society is stark. There is no group of people or sector of the economy that the Tory government is not willing to sacrifice on the altar of Brexit. As members will be aware from businesses in their areas, the challenges arising from the Tories' hard Brexit are huge. Earlier this week, I visited the East Kilbride premises of NXP Semiconductors with the Business Minister, Ivan McKee. They do lots of great work, including making microchips and creating high-skilled jobs in the process. However, their workforce is 10% down on where they could be with Brexit blamed for the EU applicants falling off a cliff edge. As I raised with the Europe Minister yesterday, the loss of freedom of movement is also affecting staffing in our health and social care services. Post-Brexit, there are massive challenges for our businesses and care services, as well as for our EU nationals living in Scotland. <laughs> 
As the committee report sets out, a fundamental consequence of Brexit is the threat it poses to the devolution settlement. With the UK Government ignoring, disrespecting and overriding this Parliament. The Tories UK Internal, Internal Market Act was a keystone of their intention to ride roughshod over the devolution settlement. Brexit has ripped Scotland from the good governance of the EU single market and into a chaotic UK internal market which cannot accommodate differences between the four nations. And the Internal Market Act was one of just six major pieces of Brexit-related legislation that this Parliament rejected and Westminster imposed. This showed, yet again, their disdain for the democratic wishes of the people of Scotland. President Officer, when I was reading the committee's report, paragraph 49 jumped out at me. I'll read the quote from the Boris Johnson and Liz Trust backing former minister Jacob Rees-Mogg for the benefit of other members. In a statement to the House of Commons, he said, as we maximise the benefits of Brexit and transform the UK into the most sensibly regulated economy in the world, we must reform the EU law we have retained on our statute book. He added that this will allow us to create a new pro-growth, high standards regulatory framework that gives businesses the confidence to innovate, invest and create jobs. Well, I'm sure all members can agree that the main growth in the UK has been that of inequality and that there has been nothing sensible about British economic policy recently. Furthermore, this talk of high standards is nothing but rhetoric from the UK Tory government, whose actions paint a different picture. The UK government is ploughing ahead with the retained EU law revocation and reform bill, which, if passed, would see the removal of thousands of pieces of EU legislation which have been modified and incorporated into domestic law. The Scottish Government is opposed to this bill because it will put standards at risk, including rights for pregnant women at work, environmental standards and requirements to label allergens in food. I welcome the Committee's call for views, which will allow businesses, civic society and the wider public to have their say on how devolution should evolve post-Brexit to meet the challenges and opportunities of the new constitutional landscape. I encourage stakeholders in East Kilbride and right across the country to have their say. For now, we need to make the most of where we are, dealing with the challenges created by a hard Brexit, which Scotland did not vote for, and implement, implemented by a government Scotland did not vote for. Not only have the wishes of the people of Scotland been ignored by both the Conservatives and the Labour Party, who endorse Brexit, but the role of this Parliament is being diminished by power grabs. Presiding officer, these are yet more examples of the cost of Westminster control. Faced with the grim reality of Brexit Britain, only independence offers Scotland a way to rejoin our friends and neighbours in the European Union and the chance to retain EU-wide protections on the environment, food standards and workers' rights. I look forward to the people of Scotland exercising their democratic right next year and choosing the fairer, greener future that independence will bring. Thank you. Thank you, Stevenson. I now call Mark Ruskell to be followed by Gillian Martin. Uh, a very generous six minutes, Mr Ruskell. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I uh, join other members in welcoming this debate and the excellent report, informed as it is by expert and learned opinion, which is coming at a point when the full horror of Brexit is really just beginning to unfold. Now, none of the Brexit outcomes have this far been surprising in any way at all. The UK government repeatedly warned itself about the economic implications of leaving the single market and ending free movement. It warned itself about the sectors of the economy that would be damaged by a hard Brexit, the businesses that would take flight, the risk of recession. But what I find ironic is that the UK of course, was so influential when it was a member of the EU, but was also so bad at explaining the benefits of that influence at home. And it also saddens me that while the UK was such a 
champion for rule of law in the EU, it is now so willing to disregard the rule of international law when it comes to the TCA and the Northern Ireland Protocol. And that arguably very British value of respect for rule of law is now clearly being championed by others, including the Irish in the EU. And I, I hope, like you know, over half of the members of this uh, parliament, that Scotland will be able to join Ireland as an independent state within an interdependent European family of nations. And that in time, the rest of these islands will follow in our footsteps and rejoin the most successful project for peace and prosperity in world history. Now, the British contribution to the a key of European law and policy has been immense. So it would be an enormous act of self-harm if the retained EU law bill results in a Brexit bonfire of the very laws that we wrote. And there are so many protections and rights that we rely on, which, unless saved, will fall off the cliff edge in December next year. From equal pay to nature protection, laws must be saved and retained. And if the UK government lights the bonfire, then there will be a desperate scrabble to save laws from the engulfing flames. It will put huge pressure on every democratic institution, every government department, every minister and parliamentarian in every parliament across the UK. It is clear that the retained EU law bill should be scrapped and individual laws prioritised for reform. So, for example, governments need to urgently change the energy performance certificate system to deliver a step change in green heating. However, the 2008 regulations come from the EU Directive on Energy Performance of Buildings. But when the UK left the EU, it did so without putting in place any way to change the regulations, which has left the Scottish Government now desperately trying to find a legislative route through a Brexit mess. So there is work to be done, but it's careful work that's needed over time, not a slash and burn spurred on by ideology. Otherwise, we will see yet another epic failure of statecraft from the UK Government. Now, we are in anything but normal times, but there needs to be respect between the UK and the devolved governments. The SEAL Convention, which a number of members have mentioned already, has been effectively abandoned since 2015. And prior to that, it had been used 140 times at Holyrood to obtain consent, which was withheld on only one occasion. But it is clear that it's now become merely an obligation to seek consent of this parliament, rather than to actually obtain it. And despite any contrary view that Holyrood might have, the box always gets ticked and the UK government always carries on regardless. Now, parliamentary oversight is a cornerstone of our British democracy. And yet we see post-Brexit legislation coming before both parliaments and the Senate with broad sweeping ministerial powers, with a strong focus on secondary legislation. It is a feast of Henry VIII's powers, now ready for UK ministers. And even the powers to amend primary legislation itself without primary consent is now on the menu. And with much of this post-Brexit legislation, there's absolutely no clarity about how secretaries of state would use the powers. What are the powers for? What is the policy objective? It's anyone's guess. Meanwhile, stakeholders fear a regulatory race to the bottom, Businesses are unsettled, certainty is eroded even further at a time when we really do need stability. For us parliamentarians, it makes scrutiny nearly impossible. But Tory MPs should be very wary of what they ask for, because when they take up their turn in opposition, there will be very few powers to challenge government policy under these Brexit bills. And this lack of scrutiny rarely makes for good decision-making, regardless of who is holding the ministerial pen at any time. Now, I'm not going to let the Scottish Government off the hook completely in this debate either, because as a parliament, we need to see our government step up and realise the keeping pace commitment in a way that is totally transparent. The government should regularly set out what it will align with, both in terms of legislation and policy, but it also needs to set out its approach to forthcoming EU legislation and the Commission's work programme as early as possible. Presiding officer, the role of parliaments in holding their executives to account has never been more important. There is a need for parliaments across these islands to work together, even if their governments are currently struggling to do so.
We may have lost the machinery of European Union that strive to build consensus amongst its decision makers and stakeholders, but it's those European values of openness and democracy that are now more important than ever, and we should uphold and defend those values in this Parliament. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Ruskell. We now um, move to Gillian Martin, who will be the final speaker in the open debate, after which, uh, for closing speeches, I would expect everybody who has uh, participated in the debate to be here in the chamber. Gillian Martin, again, a generous six minutes. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, I welcome this report, which drills down into the reality of Brexit for devolved parliaments like ours. And as someone who convened the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee at the time where we exited from the EU, and the committee was swamped by last-minute statutory instruments and LCMs from the UK Government with no detail on their implications and next to no time for scrutiny on any of the common frameworks proposed. I knew then that devolution and the role of this parliament was either by design or by lack of regard in grave danger of being seriously diminished. And I suspect the latter more than the former. But the consequences are the same. The consequences are dilution of our ability to manage devolved affairs. And I have raised both as the convener of that last session and at session five committee and now as the convener of health, social care and sport committee in this session, that lack of a statutory requirement in UK bills to seek the consent of Scottish ministers when legislating in devolved areas, but also the lack of opportunity for Scottish Parliament committee scrutiny and the inability to make recommendations in relation to those decisions. And in the Environment Committee's case, this was made even worse by repeated invitations to then Minister Therese Coffey to come and answer our questions. It was being ignored. We never saw her once during her tenure, despite those invitations. And I want to, to bring the somewhat procedural aspects of, that are all mentioned in the report, which can, uh, no offence, made uh, seem dry to the onlooker into sharp focus on one particular area that affects my constituents, and that's food standards and the arrangements around regulatory alignment or otherwise with the EU outlined in recommendation 54 of the report. The withdrawal from the EU has had disastrous consequences for growers in Scotland and some of these with immediate, uh, with immediate and remain in effect and proof that Scotland's government and parliament lack of involvement in the exit deals and the subsequent legislation that were done as they relate to agriculture. And the report made clear that there are substantive differences between the views of the UK and Scottish and Welsh governments with regard to future alignment or divergence from EU law. But I do want to even drill further into one particular set that there was actually no divergence in standards, but there are massive problems in the trade and cooperation agreement, and that's around seed potatoes. It's fair to say that seed potato farmers in particular have had the ground swept from under them by Brexit. Before Brexit, Scotland exported around 20,000 tonnes of seed potatoes, worth close to £13 million, to 18 EU countries. And uh, quite a lot of them came from my constituency. The 2020 Trade and Cooperation Agreement with Europe failed to agree equivalence on seed potatoes, and the Scottish Parliament and Government had no say in the matter. Seed potato farmers have since taken huge losses, and they're it's fair to say extremely angry over this enormous oversight by those negotiating on behalf of the UK government. However, imports of seed potatoes from the EU to the UK were made possible, with DEFRA permitting the importation and effectively crowding out of Scottish farmers from their own domestic market. And after huge pressure from the sector, this arrangement was not renewed after six months. It just was allowed to lapse, but not before doing massive financial damage to our farmers. And we were told by Brexiteers that there would be huge benefits to agriculture. Well, I say to those Brexiteers, tell that to the Lind family, three generations of seed potato growers working in my constituency to keep their business alive after it's uh, been subjected to massive losses. The ramifications of significant prohibitions of Scottish seed potatoes to the EU have created a vacuum where our potato growers, our seed uh, growers, have lost massively, with that trade being picked up by Irish growers, despite Scottish seeds conforming to the same grades and the same disease tolerances as demanded by the EU. In fact, the, 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 the seed potatoes from Scotland are actually more than demand, particularly from Eastern European uh, farmers. They're actually of better quality. 
The neglect of the seed potato sector represents just one part of a Brexit trade agreement which Scotland had no real say in, or no say at all in, and no opportunity for scrutiny on. Westminster's failure to include an agreement on equivalence for the sector in the, the cooperation agreement with Europe at the end of 2020 was an omission that's cost Scottish growers de dearly, and it didn't need to happen. That's the worst of it. If you'd actually involved Scottish ministers, involved Scottish ministers and Scottish committees in this, this might not have happened. And I want to make a particular reference and record my support to the sterling work of Martin Kennedy and Andrew Conan of NFUS, who continue to demand the UK government sort this out. Um, uh, and and I, I sense growing frustration every time, every time I meet the pair of them, uh, not least at this summer in the Tariff Show, where I had a small window of opportunity to ask the, the, make the same demands to the UK Minister uh, responsible for farming, fisheries and food, Victoria Prentice, who I might add is no longer in post. She simply blamed it all on the EU. Well, and, that, and I have to say, this did not go down at all well with North East farmers in the room. And if you've ever been in a room with North East farmers who are angry, you certainly know about it. A great number of Brexit-related bills have been passed at Westminster without the consent, um, at least of one of the devolved legislators, and the EU exit agreements have all been reached without consideration for devolved competencies. And I welcome the committee's report, which laid ba lays bare the myriad ways in which Brexit erodes, uh, could erode devolution. And as I said, uh, in agreement with Katie Clark, we should always be mindful of could. Just because the worst hasn't happened doesn't mean to say that the constitutional arrangements of Brexit between Westminster and the devolved nations couldn't give rise to it. And that's what we're here to sort out. We all need to be around the table with consent obtained before decisions, never, never after the fact. Thank you very much, uh, Ms Martin. We now move to closing speeches. I can advise the Chamber we've got a fair amount of time in hand, um, so interventions are certainly encouraged. Um, and with that, I call, call Faisal Chowdhury for a generous six minutes, Mr Chowdhury. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It is a pleasure to close this debate for Scottish Labour. Uh, I would like to thank the committee and its staff for the work that has gone into this report on a complex subject. I would also like to put on record my thanks to those who gave evidences to the committee to allow them to produce this report for the Parliament's benefit. Their contributions are much appreciated. We've heard from uh, my colleague uh, Sarah Boyack how the Sewell Convention has in recent years come under threat and is in urgent need of further clarity, particularly regarding secondary legislation. The committee report is clear that Brexit has been a significant shock to the relationship between Westminster and the devolved nations. The witnesses here by, <coughs> by the committee uh, paint a picture where the initial cases of breaking the Seal Convention for, uh, for <clears throat> reasons of urgency have in effect made it e uh, easier for the Convention to be broken down. But as the report also makes clear, the Convention was built on unst unstable ground to begin with. The phrase, not normally, was perhaps always uh, destined to end up as the subject of contention. But it is Brexit and its associated legislation which has provided the pressure that has shaken this convention. Alistair Allen uh, made that point very well. If our devolved nations are to function together again after this strained recent years, renormalizing this relationship is a requirement. Sarah Boyack has already highlighted some of the ways in which Scottish Labour believes this could happen. But as she noted, there needs to be greater transparency in how intergovernmental relationship happens, or we are just substituting devolved parliament for devolved 
executive supremacy. As the committee has highlighted in this and other recent reports, the common framework between the devolved nations need to be reinforced, but crucially also need to be uh, answered, uh, answerable to the devolved parliament. This is going to be particularly important as the nations diverge. And I recognize Willie Rennie's optimism about the lack of divergence. But my colleague Katie Clark has highlighted how it could happen in procurement. But as a current example, the First Minister attended the inaugural, uh, inaugural Prime Ministerial and Heads uh, of Devolved Governments Council on 10th November. What has been said about that in this parliament? What has been said in the meeting by the Scottish Government on behalf of the Scottish people? Do they not deserve to know? Do we not deserve to know? I have said before that this, uh, in this parliament ca cannot operate in the dark, but we are again being asked to do so. While this is not an inevitable consequence of Brexit, it is Brexit that has uh, fostered that development of this culture of executive secrecy. But as Martin Whitfield and Jenny Minto have suggested, we as a parliamentarian should have a form of solidarity with our colleagues in the other devolved parliaments and the Westminster Parliament. And I'm, I'm grateful to Jenny Minto for highlighting recent engagement uh, through the Interparliamentary Forum. It is in all our interest that these meetings and discussions do not take place behind a veil of secrecy. We are elected to represent our constituents' interest. And it is in our constituents' interest not only that those common frameworks operate effectively, but that discussion affecting them are transparent and open. The public will only be able to have faith in the devolved settlement if they are able to see how it, how it functions. I sincerely hope that both the UK and the Scottish Government will take this to heart in the coming years as we try to find the best way to navigate through our new international context. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chaudhry. Um, I now call on Sharon Dowie, uh, again, for a very generous six minutes. Please, Ms. Dowie. Thank you very much. <laughs> Presiding officer, <laughs> I'm pleased to bring this debate to a close on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. While I haven't had the pleasure of being able to sit through the evidence sessions in the SEAC committee, as the committee report shows, the impact of Brexit is very complex, and this debate only focuses on one small part of it, the impact on devolution. I would like to highlight some of the points that have been raised across the chamber today. Morris Golden talked about the strains that have tested elements of the devolution settlement. He mentioned the Sewell Convention and how its application and interpretation have clearly been tested in a way that hadn't before Brexit. Oliver Mundell talked about the need to put political differences aside and work constructively together to find solutions. Yeah. Um, Neil Gray. <laughs> yeah. Sarah Boyack. Yeah, because the thing that really struck me about uh, your colleague's contribution was that it was incredibly negative. And the, the main thing I was looking for was him to suggest how he thought the UK government could actually change its practice now, both as a, um, a government leading the way on Brexit and listening to the concerns in our report, which were unanimous, and coming up with some solutions that would remove some of the horrendous tensions that Brexit has created and try and get us to that point where people around the chamber could agree on things like environmental stand, standards, food safety, the use of chemicals. It's an opportunity, but it, it needs to be seized rather than just saying it's all too difficult. Would you Sharon, agree with me? Sharon Dowie, I can give you all of that time back. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Brexit has definitely brought challenges, but I think there, is, there will be opportunities there, but I don't think we've seen them yet. But I think it definitely needs both governments to come together and talk. But 
what my colleague was saying was the negative narrative that we get in the chamber. And to be honest, I've been here for a year and a half. And every time we get to portfolio questions, the questions that we get are always negative towards the UK government. So it needs all of us to work together to get solutions. We need solutions to Brexit. So we do need to get solutions. I'm not saying that there hasn't been challenges, but we all need to work together because we were, we were elected in here for the people of Scotland. We should be solving the problems that are in our gift to go and solve, yeah. which is justice, education, health, and given yeah. all we're sorry. No, no. Uh, Alistair Allen. I thank the member for giving way. She lists the, the areas that are within our control. Does she appreciate that the reason many of us are angry here today is it's because the areas within our devolved control that the UK is seeking to override by legislating in? One thing that we need, sorry, the one thing that we need is dialogue between both governments yep. and I don't see that happening and it takes two people to talk and it needs two people to go to the table and be constructive and be able to make compromise to get a solution to the problems. No. Can I make a wee bit more progress? Um, I'm, I know I'm getting my time back but I'm way over time now. Um, so there was lots of good in, in contributions. Sarah Boyack has said about the need for change, transparency, accountability. She mentioned keeping the pace uh, powers and the need for a mechanism for dialogue between parliaments, and I totally agree with that. Um, Willie Rennie has spoke about the fact that the debate's not moved on in three years, and I do think we need to move on. Um, Jenny Minto spoke about the normal person in the street and how Brexit was affecting that. She also spoke about the good relationship or intergovernmental relationships with DEFRA, and I definitely think that that's something we need between more governmental departments between this place and in Westminster. And I will move on now to my contribution because I am running out of time. Uh, the two key points that I'm going to touch on are the keeping peace, power and scrutiny. The Scottish Government's decision to align with EU law wherever possible is not without its consequences. As noted in the report, Professor Katie Hayward indicated that there is a lack of consideration in the Scottish Government's policy statement on alignment with EU law regarding the practical consequences of alignment for Scottish producers. This is specifically the case for those exporting to England and Wales. She goes on to state that this specifically relates to the economic impact of the UK government's intended divergence from EU laws in areas that are highly regulated and subject to detailed legislation in the EU, namely food safety and plant and animal health. Her view is that it should be made clear that the more its closest market diverges from the EU, the more difficulty there will be for Scotland if it seeks continued alignment with EU law. And this is a key point. How does Civic Scotland and other relevant stakeholders know where, how and when the Scottish Government is aligning or not? And why is it choosing to align or not? This creates unnecessary uncertainty and it means that working to a different standard for production in Scotland may negatively impact businesses' ability to compete within the UK internal market. This would cause severe damage to the Scottish economy and businesses, given that about 60% of Scottish e exports go to the rest of the UK. Yep. Last year, the Director of Policy at NFU Scotland said, if we were just to pick up and paste into Scotland the EU's current agricultural policy, that would be extremely detrimental to Scotland. That would stretch agricultural businesses to breaking point. Yep. As it stands, there is only an annual requirement to inform Parliament of when it has been used, which makes it difficult to scrutinise. It is worth recognising that the Cabinet Secretary gave evidence to the Constitution Committee and only one piece of EU legislation was actively considered for alignment and, in fact, the Scottish Government chose not to align. And I think we're entitled to question why the Scottish Government is pursuing this policy at all. And we also need to ensure that we have effective scrutiny. In written evidence, the Public Law Project noted that a broad Henry VIII power for the UK Executive to make law in any area of former EU competence would be constitutionally inappropriate. The recommendation from the Institute for Government that the UK Government shares draft bills and legislation with devolved governments is something I agree with. I think we all desire governments to work together constructively, but in order to do this, we must be prepared to enter negotiations with the willingness to compromise. Otherwise, we end up with confusion and uncertainty. Mm -hmm. 
The Public Law Project also commented that the lack of scrutiny also produces poorer quality laws and policies. However, the SNP Government should also be doing this in the Scottish Parliament as well. There are examples of the Scottish Government using Henry VIII powers too. What applies to the UK Government also applies to the Scottish Government. Yep. The Scottish Government must give the Scottish Parliament enough time to fulfil its oversight function rather than rushing through legislation. And the GRR Bill is one example. Rushing things through does not allow us as parliamentarians to scrutinise things thoroughly. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, I believe that it is in everyone's best interest for all governments to work together. The Scottish Government must work closely with the UK Government to ensure the retained EU law bill works for Scotland. Despite our political differences, we must all work together for the benefit of the United Kingdom. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms Dowie. I now call on the Minister uh, to respond on behalf of the Government uh, for a generous 10 minutes or so, Mr Gray. <laughs> I appreciate, gener appreciate your generosity, Presiding Officer, and I will look to cover as much as what has been said in the debate as I can in order to fulfil the time requirements that have been uh, set upon me. Um, in my opening remarks, Presiding Officer, I set out the Scottish Government's views on the important issues identified in the Committee's report uh, on Brexit uh, and devolution. Uh, in these closing remarks, I want to reflect on the wider issues raised by the report on Scotland's place in the UK. I will also return to the issue of the retained EU law bill and what that will tell us about the attitude of the UK Government to the issues raised today. But firstly, I want to uh, respond to some points raised uh, in the debate. I think actually it's been, uh, certainly uh, from uh, most contributions, there was wide consensus um, on the need for the respect of devolved powers and a return to the respecting of the Sewell Convention, which has, as many colleagues uh, referenced in their contributions, have, has been ripped up since uh, 2016. Uh, Sarah Boyack uh, made uh, a very strong contribution uh, and said uh, quite rightly it is not just what you say but what you do that is important and we will certainly be looking closely at what the UK Government do with regard to the retained EU law bill or the procurement bill or the trade uh, Australia New Zealand bill or the levelling up and regeneration bill, the energy bill uh, and indeed the, the, RU, uh, the retained EU law bill that all will require some form of legislative consent from from uh, this Parliament. Uh, one area that I uh, do not agree with uh, Sarah Boyock on, is, uh, which will not surprise her, is her comments on uh, independence. Uh, we now know from her leader at Westminster that, uh, and that of the Liberals that they do not want to return to the EU. So, regardless of the next UK Government's composition, the damage of Brexit that she rightly outlined will continue. Independence is the only reboot, route. Uh, two seconds. Independence is the only route back to the EU, which will be uncomfortable for, for Sarah Boyack and Willie Rennie, given their otherwise excellent speeches about the permanent costs of Brexit to Scotland. Uh, also inconvenient for Willie Rennie is his plea not to link Brexit uh, to independence, given the people of Scotland are doing uh, just that. And no wonder 70% uh, plus uh, in recent polling uh, regret Brexit, and, uh, given, and uh, an even greater number that voted to remain. I will give away to Sarah Boyack and then I will happily come back to Willie Rennie. Sarah Boyack. Oh, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> my point was about a Brexit times 10. So the Minister hasn't acknowledged that point in my speech, and it is about the disruption, the dismantling. And if you think that the 47 years, as the Cabinet Secretary informed us, of being in the EU is a long time, the 400-odd years of being in the, e the UK, massive disruption. I want to particularly make that point about the difference between a Labour government and the current Conservative government. You would not have people like William Rees-Mogg in power making things worse. You'd have a constructive, cooperative approach with a government that was aimed at working with our EU neighbours, not just to fall out with them at every single opportunity and be honest about where we could work together collaboratively, constructively, promote trade, promote high environmental standards and deliver the fantastic transformation that we need in our economy through green and sustainable development, which I think was mentioned in several speeches today, the importance of environment. We would bring all of that, um, and I think that would be transformative. 
Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And, and, and to be clear, um, I think I have more in common with Sarah Boyack than, um, uh, in some cases, uh, on the areas I'm about to talk about, that Sarah Boyack will actually have with her own Labour colleagues. Um, but um, the inconvenient truth uh, for Sarah Boyack uh, is that the Labour Party wishes uh, to maintain uh, Brexit. Uh, I take it granted that um, uh, you know, we want the back of the Tories and uh, you know, I, I want to see their defeat uh, at the next general election. But the Labour proposition is to maintain Brexit. It's also to do further damage to the Scottish economy uh, by imposing even tougher immigration uh, rules than uh, the, the Tories currently do, as evidenced in recent uh, interviews by Rachel Reeves, which is why I think uh, we share more in common uh, in Scotland um, with uh, our Labour colleagues and perhaps some uh, will do um, with their colleagues uh, down the road. Independence is the only route by which we can get back into the European Union to enjoy the benefits uh, that that gives uh, Scotland. And that is why I'm not surprised to see public opinion uh, is so supportive of a return uh, to the EU uh, and the, the linkage that there is there with uh, the independence uh, debate. Uh, Jenny Minto was also right. Uh, sorry, I forgot. Uh, Willie Rennie. Willie Rennie. Thank, thank the Minister. My Whilst the Minister has been in a reasonable uh, mood, I hope I can persuade him to uh, agree with me. Isn't it the case that, as the SNP now is proposing with its new currency arrangement, that will be both outside the UK and the EU for at least 10 years, and because the SNP are now admitting that there will be checks at the border, isn't it the case that the SNP are the new Brexiteers? Whoa. Minister. Uh, Willie Rennie offered uh, for me to be reasonable, and I think he then came forward with a rather unreasonable uh, and inaccurate, actually, intervention. There's not, th th I don't, um, uh, I, I don't recognise the characterisation uh, that uh, Willie Rennie gave in the first part or the latter part of uh, his uh, contribution. Um, yes, there will be, um, uh, you know, a, a, an opportunity for us to break down 27 borders uh, with our EU neighbours um, in regards to trade which of course is an opportunity uh, uh, that independence offers us, that, uh, that Brexit uh, has put up borders uh, to our trade. So clearly there's opportunities there and I'm happy uh, to at any stage have a discussion uh, with Welly Rennie around the economic paper and the proposals that we have uh, regards uh, independence uh, so that he can, we can make sure that the public are fully informed of the opportunities uh, that come forward uh, from our prospectus. Uh, Jenny Minto uh, quite rightly uh, recognised the elephant in the room about uh, UK government government relations with the EU, but also relations within the EU, uh, the UK. She's absolutely right. Uh, the UK government's approach to Brexit has meant that the devolved governments have actually become stronger uh, and more closely aligned and worked together on far more areas uh, because of the lack of respect of the devolved governments. Um, and there are a number of areas uh, within my own responsibilities, including on Ukraine, where sadly, where previously there was very good working relationship, sadly of late, um, both myself and my Welsh counterpart uh, have not had the constructive engagement on which we would want to see. So it's a permeation, uh, not just on Brexit and Brexit-related issues, but it's now moving much further than that in terms of a lack of respect of the devolved uh, governments. Of course. Martin Whitfield. I'm very, I'm, very great. I'm very grateful to Neil Gray to give way on that point. And Jenny Minto agreed um, that it is really or it should be possibly for the parliaments to solve, in particular, I'll choose the problem of legislative consent motion. Would the Scottish Government give the support to the parliament to seek that solution? Minister. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear the consideration that uh, the proposal that uh, Martin Whitfield would look to put forward around uh, how that could be brought forward. And I'm happy to take it offline in terms of how he feels that that could, could work, of course. Um, Katie Clark, in another um, excellent uh, speech, um, was absolutely right to uh, challenge uh, and to say that there is a need for dialogue with the EU and, uh, and when Scotland is independent with the rest of the UK as well. Uh, I would say that it will be better um, there for uh, that to happen on the basis uh, that independence gives us that opportunity to do so in the partnership of equals uh, as opposed to what we have at the moment. She was also quite right to challenge uh, Oliver Mundell uh, of uh, the lack of any plan for Brexit by those who supported Brexit, like Mr Mundell and the then Tory UK government. Um, so, um, Colette Stevenson uh, also right about the intentions of the... Of course. Oliver Mundell. <laughs> 
There, were, there was various uh, solutions put forward uh, to the House of Commons around how we'd leave uh, the EU. Um, I wonder if the member wanted to explain uh, why he wasn't uh, able to vote for uh, a permanent and comprehensive customs union if he's going to criticise other people uh, for not engaging seriously about what Brexit might look like. Minister. Again, it's an inconvenient truth for uh, Oliver Mundell that the Scottish Government at the time put forward a compromise position to the UK Government around, in spite of the fact, notwithstanding the fact that we didn't want Brexit to happen, how there could be compromise that respected the fact that Scotland voted uh, to remain in the U EU. Uh, the UK Government chose to ignore that. Now, I, I, think, uh, I think I've uh, answered the point um, comprehensively that uh, we put forward a compromise solution, the UK Government chose to ignore that, and we're now in the situation uh, that we are where the, the UK Government continues to ignore the Scottish Parliament uh, and the Scottish Government, which is why uh, the committee has had to come forward with the report that it has. Also excellent contributions from Colette Stevenson, from Mark Ruskell, uh, Gillian Martin uh, as well, and it uh, just serves to highlight the importance of this debate that so many strong contributions were, were made. Uh, I think it's important in considering Brexit and devolution to recognise three underlying points. First, Brexit has been imposed on the people of Scotland against their will and has been hugely damaging. Secondly, it was not inevitable that the damage of Brexit would lead to further centralisation of power in Whitehall, nor a weakening of uh, devolved responsibilities. This was a deliberate choice by the UK Government. And thirdly, there is nothing in the UK's constitutional arrangements that could prevent any UK Government doing the same thing, either for something as significant as Brexit or for any other reason. I'm old enough to remember, uh, as I've highlighted to Oliver Mundell, uh, that I, I was an MP at Westminster at the time, uh, in December 2016, when the then Prime Minister Theresa May apparently agreed to give devolved governments a role in establishing a UK as opposed to a UK government Brexit negotiating position. Sadly, it became clear very quickly that Mrs May had no intention of following these commitments. There was no genuine engagement with the Scottish Government's proposals for a less damaging form of Brexit, either for Scotland or for the UK as a whole. She chose to ignore Scotland and boxed herself in uh, with her self-defeating red lines. The only negotiations that would be relevant were between various wings of the Conservative Party. The hard Brexit we have since endured was not inevitable and the more damaging effects on devolution were entirely avoidable. And I, 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 comment the, I commend the remarks from Gillian Martin in this regard to the impact this has had, uh, this lack of UK government engagement has had on the farmers in her constituency and across Scotland. Now we have the retained EU law bill. Again, the UK government proposes to impose it. No, I think I'm pretty pushed for time now, President Officer, I, be I believe. We have a little time in I'm hand. Happy to. Oliver Mundell. Yeah, I, I thank uh, the Minister for giving way, uh, but what would he say to farmers in my constituency who have uh, extra money in their pocket as a result of the flexibility on LFAS that leaving the EU brings? Have they to give that money back? And Minister, and also if you could wind up. Okay, thank you, President Officer. I think, um, the, uh, uh, given what Gillian Martin has outlined, uh, I would imagine the, the sentiments are similar uh, in uh, the farming communities across Scotland around regards the impact that there has been, there has been since Brexit on our food producers. So, in conclusion. Um, the Scottish Government's view is clear. The only independence can guarantee Scotland democracy, Scotland's democracy are placed as an equal member of the family of nations. Others have different views. But as this report and today's debate has shown, we can all see the problems in the relationships that there are between uh, within the, e the UK and with our neighbours in Europe as a result of the UK Government's positions. It's much harder to see any solutions for as long as Scotland remains under Westminster control. I'm therefore grateful for the Committee for its important work so far. I look forward to uh, uh, proceeding with the further inquiries identified to which the Scottish Government will make a full contribution. Thank you. And I call on Donald Cameron on behalf of the Constitution, Europe, External Affairs and Culture Committee to wind up the debate. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And it's a great pleasure to close for the committee and reiterate thanks already expressed to the clerks, uh, the witnesses, those who, who gave written evidence, and to colleagues on the committee and others who have uh, taken part this afternoon and contributed in a constructive manner. I hope what we have highlighted in the committee report uh, may have resonated with colleagues. However esoteric and technical some of these matters uh, might seem, and Gillian Martin, I think, said that they were dry, uh, and for my part, feel no need to apologise for dryness when it comes to um, issues of uh, 
the, the devolution settlement, and, and, I, and I don't think she needs to either. Um, I think it's also important to acknowledge that the issues in the report are relatively narrow. Uh, that's not to diminish the importance of them, however, but the report concerns the effects of Brexit on devolution, not the effects of Brexit per se. Now, of course, Brexit has had a profound impact across Scotland on various different sectors and industries, on academia, on learning, on culture, on agriculture, and many other aspects of life. And we've heard very um, divergent views uh, on many sites this afternoon. But our report is more specific than simply a question about the consequences of Brexit. It's about the impact on devolution. And amongst other things, on the working of the devolution settlement, on relations between the UK government, uh, on the one hand, and the Scottish government, the Welsh government, Northern Ireland executive, uh, and of course, the relationship between the legislatures uh, on the, um, within the UK. Uh, issues of delegated powers exercised at UK and Scottish Government level are also some of the issues that we um, considered. And that's significant because the committee is about to embark on a wider inquiry on these matters, which will follow that, that focused remit. Now, before I respond to some of the contributions in the debate, I'd like to add uh, some detail to one aspect of the inquiry touched on by the convener in her opening remarks, that being the matter of delegated powers. A key theme from our report is that there has been a step change in the approach to the use of delegated uh, powers. When the Scottish Parliament was established, the powers of UK ministers to make secondary legislation in devolved areas were transferred to Scottish ministers with only a few exceptions. And we have, as a committee, identified two areas of contention. Those being, firstly, the scope of delegated powers being conferred on UK ministers in devolved areas and on Scottish ministers where these powers are concurrent. And secondly, that the Sewell Convention does not apply to secondary legislation. Now, the uh, then Secretary of State for Leveling Up Housing and Communities stated in a letter to the DPLR committee uh, that powers for the UK government to make statutory instruments in devolved areas are not new and have been used across a wide range of policy areas since the advent of devolution. However, prior to the UK leaving the EU, UK ministers would principally make secondary legislation in devolved areas that implemented EU obligations and did that with the consent of Scottish ministers. The UK government did not generally apply powers to make secondary legislation in devolved areas, although some argue some argue that the UK government does nevertheless have the ability to do so. And with that said, there is of course a difference between delegated powers to deliver a legal obligation to comply with EU law and delegated powers in the same policy areas without that particular constraint. And the committee's view is that the extent of UK ministers' new delegated powers in devolved areas amounts to a significant constitutional change. And concerns have been raised that this is happening on an ad hoc and iterative basis without any overarching consideration of the impact on devolution. Minister. Thank you, uh, President Officer. I thank the Deputy Convener for giving way. Does he, uh, in what, given what he has said, does he share my concern that that constitutional change, which is impacting on the devolved settlement, impacting on the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government, will be made even worse with the passage of the retained EU law bill? Donald Cameron. Well, I, I think I'm speaking on behalf of the committee. I mean, the committee is certainly concerned uh, at, the, at what has happened so far. And the committee is also, I think the convener referenced this, the committee is also about to take a lot of evidence on retained EU law, where that issue will be very much front and, and centre. And in our report, we um, raise a range of questions that are in need of further scrutiny, which we have outlined in our report. And they include whether it's appropriate for UK ministers to have considerable new delegated powers in devolved areas without any consideration of the impact on devolution? To what extent is there a risk in the Scottish Parliament's legislative and scrutiny function from the post-EU uh, increase in size and use of delegated powers at both a UK government level but also by Scottish ministers? Um, can I make a bit more progress, uh, please? Um, and how the post-EU limitations of the Sewell Convention, as covered by the convener earlier, need to be addressed in considering the effectiveness of consent mechanisms when it comes to secondary legislation. Uh, Presiding officer, I briefly want to turn to some of the many contributions uh, 
made during the debate. Uh, if I could canter through those as quickly as possible, uh, Maurice Golden spoke about the need to evolve the devolution settlement uh, in the interests of Scotland and the need uh, for dialogue and mutual respect. Sarah Boyack, uh, as ever, made the point about the importance of transparency uh, and accountability, uh, as she rightly always, always does. Uh, Willie Rennie um, spoke about hyperbole on, on both sides uh, and the fact that we haven't had a debate on the substantive issues at stake here. Uh, his view was that divergence hasn't really happened, but neither have we seen uh, the benefits of Brexit that were promised. Um, Jenny Minto spoke about the impact of EU law. She qu quoted evidence that we heard last week in committee and spoke about the importance of, of good relations. Uh, Oliver Mundell spoke longingly for the Mike Russell era uh, and um, nostalgically um, spoke about his, um, his, his memories of those, those debates. Um, and his view, his view, which is important to uh, um, note, was that the Scottish Government did not approach uh, this constructively, that they disrupted Brexit, in his opinion, and stoked grievance and promoted independence. And that is what he said has damaged relations and why tensions exist. Alistair Allen also spoke about the retained EU law um, issues and the sheer amount of legislation uh, that that will involve. Um, he, like many others, concentrated on legislative consent. Does Sewell have any residual force, I think he asked. Uh, Katie Clark spoke about the need for cooperation and she, she uh, mentioned the area of procurement um, and that there are choices to be made now uh, where divergence could happen. And I think uh, she approved of the ability to diverge. She'll correct me if, if that's wrong. But she certainly approved of the need for this parliament to look at and debate uh, the issues properly. Colette Stevenson spoke about, um, uh, in her view, the UK government ignoring, disrespecting this parliament. Again, she concentrated on, on the Sewell Convention and un argued that the uh, uh, Scottish parliament had been undermined. Yes, very quickly. Sarah Boyack. Can I thank the member for taking intervention? I realise he is getting near the end of his time. Um, would he accept as Deputy Convener that it might actually be helpful if we had a UK minister prepared to come and visit our committee? Because it is constructive, it's cross-party, and although we ask difficult questions, we're asking difficult questions to actually make devolution work and be successful. Donald Cameron. Uh, yes, I do agree with that. Um, Mark Ruskell uh, spoke about the, the, the irony, he said, of the UK being so influential within the EU, uh, but yet so bad, in his view, at explaining the benefits of, of membership. And he, he spoke about the respect for the rule of law, subject dear to my heart, and the urgency uh, of action that's required. Um, Gillian Martin, uh, a very interesting uh, contribution about her experience as convener of two committees, uh, uh, dealing with the, kind of, the practical day-to-day -day, uh, issues that arise when legislative consent motions come to a committee uh, and the ability of, of this parliament to scrutinise decisions of, of, of the UK government. And I think in one of the finest speeches this afternoon, Foisal Chowdhury spoke about the history of the convention, the Seal Convention, and how it was built on unstable ground uh, and that the words not normally were always going to be um, contentious. He argued, like many others, for a renormalisation uh, of relations. Sharon Dowie, um, the need for compromise and engagement, that it takes two to talk and that parity is important. What applies to the UK government also applies to the Scottish government, in her view. And uh, finally, the minister, who uh, made many points about the centralisation that Brexit's caused, about the issues arising from Sewell, uh, and um, the fact that his experience as an MP in the sort of Brexit years uh, from 2016 onwards were, were so important. He was standing in for the Cabinet Secretary very ably. The Cabinet Secretary, of course, who told us in the Constitutional Committee that he is in London meeting the UK Government. So an example of the Scottish Government and the UK Government cooperating that we can all celebrate, presiding officer. So to conclude, there are fundamental questions about how devolution works outside the EU. We believe that we need a wider debate on the varied and complex issues raised by our report. Uh, a debate not just for governments and parliaments, but for businesses, stakeholders, civic society and the wider public. And we hope today's discussion has contributed to that wider debate. Can I support the motion in the convener's name? Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate on the impact of Brexit on devolution. It's now time to move on to the next item of business. There's one question to be put as a result of today's business. And that question is that motion 6732, 
In the name of Claire Adamson, on behalf of the Constitution Europe External Affairs and Culture Committee, on the impact of Brexit on devolution, be agreed. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed. That concludes decision time and I close this meeting.